Welcome to this evening's study session of the City Council. Agendas for study sessions, including concept reviews, can be found by visiting Broomfield's website at broomfield.org. Earlier this evening, City Council met in an executive session at 515 for the purpose of obtaining instruction to negotiators and receiving legal advice regarding the Jefferson Parkway Public Highway Authority. This executive session was approved at the May 10th, 2022 City Council meeting. The public agenda this evening includes one concept review and one study session item. Members of the public may attend tonight's meeting in person at the George DeSiro City and County Buildings Council Chambers located in One Tacoma Drive or watch live on Channel 8 and through streaming on their Bill's website. The public may also participate in public comment on the concept review item only, either in person or by calling 855-695. 3744 and pressing star three to be placed in the queue for comment. Public comment will be limited to 90 minutes total per item, and the individuals attending in person will speak first. The first one through 15 participants in the queue have three minutes to speak, the next 16 through 25 have two minutes, and if time remains, the next 26 plus participants in the queue have one and a half minutes to speak. Again, if joining us virtually for public comment, the number to call is 855. 695-3744 and press star three to ensure you're making for comments. If joining in person, we'll ask you to come to the podium and state your name and neighborhood for the record. As stated earlier, public comment will be welcomed on the concept review item only. Tonight's concept review is a proposal for a come and go gasoline station and convenience store within the Hanson's Corner PUD area. We'll follow the city standard procedures for concept plan reviews. First, the staff will present a summary of the application. Following the staff summary, the applicant will make their presentation. We will then take comments from members of the Land Use Review Commission and other interested advisory boards, followed by public comment. Then the applicant will have an opportunity for final comments and finally questions and comments from the City Council. Electronic copies of concept review plans are available at broomfieldvoice.com. Copies of comments provided for each plan at roomfieldvoice.com have been provided to the City Council and can be found by clicking the correspondence link at the bottom of tonight's agenda. Council members have a copy of the agenda memorandum for this proposal, which I'll ask our staff to summarize. Thank you, Mary, and good evening, Council and the community. Judy Homer is going to walk us through this item. Ms. Judy. Thank you, City Council Manager Hoffman. Good evening, uh, City Council and Mayor. Judy Hammer, representing uh, the Planning Division. Next slide, please. The concept plan is for a gasoline station and a 3,968-square-foot convenience store on a 1.74-acre <coughs> lot that is located at the southwest corner of Lowell and Midway Boulevards. The subject site is governed by the Hanson Corner PUD Plan Unit Development Plan that allows for gasoline stations subject to a use by special review permit. The site includes a 25 foot buffer setback that currently contains uh, some landscaping along the west side of the lot. Next slide, please. This aerial shows the location in relation to surrounding property. It is located at 12755 Lowell Boulevard. The Brandywine single family residential neighborhood is located immediately to the west. Roomfield Community Commons open space is to the north with the Conoco 7-Eleven uh, over there where you see Westlake Complex, uh, directly kitty corner to the northeast. Uh, there is a storage facility immediately to the south of the site that is also located within the Hanson's Corner PUD, and that's in the lower part of the slide. Next slide, please. Staff has prepared a video to highlight the location of the subject properties. And we'll start the video. Video is taken from the northwest corner of Lowell Boulevard and, Mid and Midway Boulevard. It starts out looking west along Midway. It pans to the south. You can see the storage facility there as we pan to the south. And then it across the site and continues around to the beginning. So you're looking kind of east, and then we're panning around to where the 7 Eleven signage is there. And the Conoco.
And then we're along Sheridan or Lowell Boulevard, excuse me, and then the Commons. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, that would be for the comprehensive. Thank you. For the comprehensive plan, the land use designation for the site is mixed use commercial. The proposed use is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Next slide, please. This shows the layout of the concept plan that was reviewed uh, by referral agencies and planning staff. This drawing shows the proposed layout of the gas station and convenience store, parking, landscaping, and signage and access to the site. As outlined in the staff report, the establishment will provide fuel, fresh food choices, propane tank exchange services, and various seasonal outdoor sales items. The proposed store hours are 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 30 parking spaces to include ADA accessible are also proposed. Uh, the following slides show the drawings of the proposed architecture of the gas station. The architectural renderings of the side and front elevations that would face Lowell and Midway Boulevards respectively are shown here. The side is at the lower um, part of the screen. That would be facing Lowell Boulevard. Next slide, please. This is the architectural rendering of the gasoline pump station canopy. The rendering on the top shows the north elevation and how it would appear as one approaches the site from the north traveling southbound. The drawings on the lower left show the elevations of the canopy from the east, and the one on the lower right shows it shows its appearance from the west. Next slide, please. In preparation for this concept plan, the applicant hosted a virtual neighborhood meeting on January 26, 2022. The questions posed by attendees were about the desirability of the use when considering there are two other gasoline stations just across the street on Lowell Boulevard. Other questions were related to how the proprietor would offset impacts with regards to noise, traffic, and lighting. The city and county of Brimfield standard public notice requirements have been met for this case. Staff has identified two key issues with this proposal. One is the close proximity to the residential uses. The proposed development is adjacent to the Brandywine neighborhood. The business is proposed to operate 24 hours a day, seven days per week to help offset impacts related to lighting traffic noise. Uh, the existing 25 foot buffer should be uh, extensively landscaped with variated um, evergreen trees. Exterior lighting should be carefully situated to ensure that it meets dark sky and or cool cutoff requirements. Uh, the relationship of the requested use to the character of the surrounding neighborhood is a factor to consider in relation to the requested use by special review. Number two on the key issue is the desirability of the use. Factors to be considered in relation to the use by special review are the desirability and the need for this use. As we reviewed, uh, there are two other gasoline stations in close proximity to this development. Um, the resulting business does not appear to increase the activity, products, and services for the business, or business approaches to serve neighborhood and community residents and businesses. This concludes staff's presentation. The applicant is here to present the proposal in further detail. To, and they will include recent changes that they made to the landscaping and other site design details in response to resident concerns and comments provided during the constant plan review. Thank you. Thank you. The applicant's presentation is next. Will the applicant's representative please identify themselves for our listeners before beginning your brief presentation this evening? Uh, my name is Erica Morton. I am um, the civil engineer for the site. I work for Olson. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of Come and Go. Next slide. So I want to take this time since Judy did a good job of kind of showing the site um, to sort of address some of the concerns that were brought up with the staff report and the neighborhood comments. 
Um, the main things that um, we noticed were um, the site, there's no need for a third fuel station or similar use at this intersection. Fungal will have a negative impact on the surrounding businesses and it's too close to nearby residential homes. The site has been zoned for commercial use for many years now and allows for a convenience store with the use by special review to give surrounding property owners informed site design, in addition to the city council um, providing conditional use requirements. Uh, Chemigo has done extensive market analysis on this corner and determined that uh, this intersection can support a third fuel station, otherwise they wouldn't be proposing to build anything here. Um, we can provide that market analysis documentation if requested. Um, there were concerns raised in the staff report for cannibalization of um, existing fuel stations in the area. Um, ultimately, this would happen no matter who builds on this corner, whether it's um, a mom and pop coffee shop, they're going to take coffee sales from 7 Eleven. Um, it's kind of just how the market works, capitalism, right? Um, the real estate prices, as everybody knows, have gone up a lot recently, um, and the land here is very expensive, so that's somewhat cost prohibitive for smaller businesses to enter this corner. Um, I want to go through a few things that set Camelot apart as um, a convenience store. They are still a family-owned business for over 60 years now. Their product offerings are typically um, a bit better quality than what you would see at a standard convenience store. They have a lot of fresh food choices. 70% um, of their associates are full-time employees with full benefits. They have several philanthropic initiatives, um, donating to charity. Um, they are the leading convenience store business in environmental sustainability. There will be EV charging provided on day one of the site opening, and then eventually there will be eight charging stations provided at this site on full EV build out. To help with concerns of the proximity to the residential area, we designed the site layout to keep the building as far away from the residential homes as possible. It's over 100 feet away from the western property boundary where the residential lots sit. We're also proposing additional landscaping in um, the Western landscape buffer area. We have evergreen trees, and then there's also some existing trees that will mature further and fill in that whole area. We can also upgrade the existing privacy fence or install a new, maybe taller privacy fence to help with additional screening there. Uh, that's pretty much on this slide, please. So some of these bullets I've already um, discussed, but this is kind of my summary of the neighborhood feedback that we received between now and the neighborhood meeting back in January. Um, so I'm going to skip over a couple of these due to time constraints. Um, the first one here that I want to discuss is the traffic concerns. So come and go is not a destination. Um, people don't necessarily leave their house just to go to a gas station. So really their main market is going to be pulling cars from existing traffic at the intersection. And it's also going to be pulling mainly eastbound traffic, whereas the Alta and the 7-Eleven on the east side of Lowell are going to be pulling the northbound, westbound, and southbound traffic. Um, we'll also be doing a full traffic study with our SDP and USR process. A few of the environmental concerns that were raised were in relation to fuel vapor noise and light pollution. Um, the fuel delivery trucks for the site operate on a completely closed system. So when trucks are dropping fuel at the underground storage tanks, which are located on the north portion of the site, um, those trucks will capture any vapors that are released, or they won't be released really. They'll be captured in um, some pipes from the storage tank system and be taken back to the um, fuel depot where they get filtered and then released safely. The um, there's a vent system in the underground storage tanks, but it's purely intake. So all, it, all it's doing is pulling air from outside to um, replace the fuel that re is removed when people fill up their cars. Um, so really any odor that is noticed on site is going to be from customers opening up gas tanks and maybe dripping a couple of drops of fuel on the concrete. Um, cars don't really spend a too, much, too much time idling on this site because it's essentially a parking lot. You know, you have to shut your car off when you're filling up or when you're going to go inside and usually shut it off. Um, so on 
the noise, we've done several studies at actually some other adjacent sites or in the area where um, we measure the noise levels of the existing street, and we've proven that the existing ambient noise levels are consistently much lower than the noise levels that are generated from the site itself. Uh, people aren't really honking their horns or creating a lot of noise on site. And like I said, it's essentially a parking lot, and they're pretty quiet. The lighting for the site is going to be all LED, and the fixtures are fully cut off, so there's no light spill over the property line. Um, we do photometric plans on every site to show the light levels and make sure that they're in compliance with the city's requirements. As far as crime rates go, um, Congo doesn't necessarily attract new crime. Um, if the neighborhood is safe today, it's going to be safe when Congo builds. And then the last concern that I'd like to discuss is the property values, which is a little bit more difficult to measure. Um, we know home values are generally always going up. This property, since it's been zoned commercially for many years, we're not really changing that. Um, so we wouldn't expect the properties to go down to it due to a change in use or change in zoning. And Congo has not seen any cases in their markets where the property values have been negatively impacted by their store developments. Um, all that being said, Congo fully intends to comply with all city codes and requirements and any reasonable conditional use requirements. Um, so we just ask that you give us a chance to show you how we can do that with the SDP and the USR process. I have a little bit more time to get one of those slides. You want to maybe go to the very end and we'll go backwards. So this is an image of some of the food choices that they have in the interior of the store. You get a previous slide. This is an image of one of their existing stores that was built. It's pretty open and clean. Next. This is the seating area inside. Next. This is the kitchen where everything is made um, fresh daily. Next. This is our rendering of the site facing southeast. Um, you can see we have a screen wall provided along midway, and you'll see there's also going to be one along with the other renderings. Um, it's a little bit hard to see the landscaping in the right side of the screen, but that will be um, much more dense once we um, once we build here. Next. This is the view facing southwest from the intersection. So you're standing kind of on the corner by the 7-Eleven. You can see the screen walls here too. Next. And then this is the view from facing northwest. Again, screen walls trying to provide buffer for headlights shining into the public roadway. One more back. This is the elevations, which Judy already has kind of shown. And then one more back, and that will show the latest and greatest landscaping plan. You can see here there's a lot of dense trees. The dashed circles are actually the existing trees. When they fully mature, they'll be about the size of the circles. And then we've added a bunch of evergreens to help with um, screening during the winter. That's really all I have. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we're going to see if are there are any members of the Land Use Review Commission present who would like to comment on this proposal. Being the only one, I guess I should speak. Them. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Um, just a quick comment. I studied this afternoon about uh, uh, EV vehicles. It was interesting because, uh, first of all, I admire their uh, business model and certainly their community outreach sounds very good. Um, but the research showed that there's 6.3% EV vehicles on the road now. 2025, they'll be 10%. 2030, they'll be 30%. That's just in seven and a half years. So in seven and a half years, a 30% of cars being electric, fewer oil change businesses, fewer auto service businesses, and fewer gas stations will be needed. And that's just in seven and a half years. And I think where we have two close by gas stations, which could add EV charging stations, just like come and go plans to do, uh, that with that proximity, I think we should be careful as a city in approving gas stations, looking at what's going to happen in the future. 
particularly we have enough in the area in the area already. So it's my only comments. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Are there any other boards and commissions members who would like to comment on this proposal? Well, next is public comment. As mentioned earlier, the public may comment in person or on the phone. And if you're joining us on the phone and want to be placed in the queue for comment, please call 855-695-3744 and press star three. If you're joining in person, please line up behind the podium. Public comments will be limited to the times outlined earlier. Anyone in person care to comment? Um, hello, um, my name is Helen Bevington. I live at 128 on King Street in Bloomfield. And um, I just have to agree that there are already two gas stations there. And even with a lot of really great landscaping, it's just another gas station on a corner, on a very busy corner, right across from our open space. Um, I realize there's already a gas station where the 7 Eleven is, but bearing gas tanks and all that there across from the open space that I walk in every day. I just don't see that as a good thing. So um, I didn't know the statistics about electric cars, but that's something I thought about too. So I just don't think but it's needed there. So thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Hi, my name is Josh McFly. I live at uh, 3800 Shepherd Drive, just around the corner from the proposed site. Uh, I agree with my neighbor here and uh, probably many of the people that were at the original January meeting. It, it seems redundant to have a third gas station <laughs> in an intersection already filled with two gas stations. Um, whether the land is for sale or not, I guess it's up to the, the, the city and county of Broomfield. I often just think you should just leave it a lot, personally. Um, the traffic does get pretty busy, specifically around the four to five to six o'clock hours. Um, and going in that direction from the east or from the west going east. Um, so in the mornings, there's traffic heading from the east to the west and it's coming back in the afternoon after work hours. Uh, having a gas station at that particular corner, I think is going to cause an even uh, deeper backup of cars at the low and midway intersection, simply trying to get in and out of uh, gas stations. And we've all experienced that. Um, but in general, I think the business's arguments, uh, personally, this is not uh, meant to uh, insult anyone, but it seemed a little shallow on my, from my perspective. Uh, they are going to be looking for positive reasons that favor their own research in order to put the best light on their own research for their own purposes. Um, <laughs> like, for example, the argument of the coffee shop potentially going there one day, hypothetically taking business away from 7-Eleven. Um, if that was the case, then I don't understand why 7-Eleven would be selling anything other than coffee. Um, they're not in the business for selling coffee, they sell gasoline as well. Um, why not make a proposal to purchase the Western instead, remodel that space there, um, there's a lot of other uh, useful useful business purposes outside of this developing the land and causing more traffic um, and more uh, uh, reasons to make living in that particular neighborhood a little less attractive. So um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I don't see anyone in person. Um, did the applicant have any final comments before we move to council questions? I think I'll just say that um, there's a whole bunch of slides in the middle there that I kind of didn't think I'd have time for, but if you have any questions on the slides, there's um, lots of detailed information about the environmental, um, the economic analysis that they've done, the philanthropy, so we can flip to those if needed. Okay, we'll let you know. We're going to go to council questions and comments now. Um, Mayor Pro Tem, you go first. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to be brief and um, unusually direct on this one. So I, I'm a firm no on this project. 
Uh, it's nothing against your engineering firm or come and go, which I'm sure is a, a great gasoline company. But I'm one of the, the few folks on council here that was here when we originally approved the storage facility. And at that time, we were given a, a, a carrot that, that promised us a nice uh, little strip plaza that was going to have local restaurants and uh, coffee shops, as you heard. Um, what we're seeing here today is not a strip, little strip plaza with the, the coffee shop nor uh, a, a local restaurant. So I'm going to hold the, the land over to that and um, uh, firm no on this one. And also, regardless of the promises that were made, as was heard, there are two existing gas stations on that corner, and there's really zero need for, for a third one. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Tim. And um, Council Member Marshall, should we did have a late caller join to provide public comment. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the uh, caller on the phone, Troy Letta. You have three minutes. Thanks. Um, hi. I just wanted to add my no, uh, the the last speaker actually said exactly what I wanted to mention was that it feels a bit like a bait and switch with the original meeting. Uh, the, the city in general approved the storage facility under the assumption that there would be something like a mini mall there with some small locally owned businesses. And now this is the second time they've tried to put in a large automotive facility instead. That was all. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll return to council member comments. Council member Marshall. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to start off by saying this is not, my comments have nothing to do with the business model of Come and Go or how great they are as a company and you know, EV started charging stations and everything that Come and Go would do, that's great. Um, but this, my comments are in regards to the developer and the owner of this property, like Mayor Brooke Tim Jasinski, um, with all due respect to them, there is absolutely no chance I would approve, to approve this project ever as it currently constituted. Um, as Member Dem mentioned, we were councils and the community was promised a coffee shop type neighborhood facility when they were coerced, not coerced, but agreed to do the uh, storage unit, which by the way, I would not have voted to approve either, um, even though my predecessor did. Um, you know, this, and the caller Troy mentioned that this isn't the first time that this oh, property owner has come forward with something other than what they promised. They, a few years ago, they came forward with a car repair type place. Um, and council at that time gave their opinion that that was not going to happen anyway. So my, my question to the developer, the owner of this property, who doesn't appear to be here tonight, is how is this proposal anything other than a waste of council, staff, and community's time? If they want to develop this property, they need to come forward with something that we will approve. Um, and if they want to talk to us, they can come talk to myself or Mayor Tim Jaziski. Um, they haven't done that. Um, and so as a representative of, of Ward 1 and a homeowner in Brandy 1, um, I am opposed to this project. So, thank you. Thank you. Any other council member comments? Council member Cohen? Just a couple of quick questions, comments, I guess. I would say that um, I'm disinclined to say a business shouldn't come into an area because there's two other businesses in the area um, because you might be able to do it better. And I think if there were three and this was built, there would pretty, probably pretty soon be just two again. Um, I think we know the quality that Come and Go brings. But, and I also would you note know, the issue of access. Um, I think it's a real one, but it's the same one that's 7 Eleven faces. It's pretty much the same exact traffic flow. Um, I do though have concerns about the buffers for the residents on that corner. I think I use that corner a good mile north of this and drive through there every day. And when I did hear it was scheduled to be a gas station, I was thinking that's the last thing anyone would want um, for that location. Um, so to, to I'm not familiar with the issues of what the developer promised before because it wasn't on council, but my main concerns going forward would be uh, whatever else could be done if this was approved to provide a sufficient buffer for light noise and, and everything else that accompanies a 24 seven gas station. I don't know if there's anything else that can be realistically done more than a few evergreen trees to protect the Brandywine neighborhood in that area. Thank you. Council Member Schaaf. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so I was, I 
was looking at the PUD, and uh, this is designated as a mixed-use development, uh, or the PUD designates this lot as a mixed-use development um, that is going to be a neighborhood center, and that's uh, in quotation marks, uh, and divides the permitted uses into two categories, lots one and two, incorporates uh, uses consistent with a business district and lists some of the primary uses, uh, self-storage uh, self uh, facility, caretaker unit. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, that neighborhood center doesn't necessarily jive with the statement that the applicant made, which was the come and go is not a destination. Uh, we are trying to pull existing traffic off the road from their business. So it's not necessarily a neighborhood connection, and it's not a neighborhood center if it's just pulling non-neighbors uh, in there. So those those two things just definitely don't jive, and, and that would be a concern of mine. Um, I, I was uh, not on council, but I was in the chambers when when the uh, storage facility was approved. Um, and uh, there definitely was, you know, that carrot for this development, uh, that this would be a retail uh, establishment. Um, and I, without that, uh, it's it's going to be very hard for me to approve this um, because the come and go, while there's some retail um, uses within that gas station, that's not the primary use. The primary use is the gas station. And we talked a lot about that as the applicant, uh, that the, the idea is we're pulling traffic to you know, fill up uh, and, and utilize gas. Um, I, I would agree with the staff memo that there's a couple of goals, uh, encourage and support commercial development that contributes to a diverse community image and a vibrant character that provides increased choices and services. Having three gas stations on the same corner, adding one more to, or adding, having two gas stations existing, adding one more, uh, doesn't necessarily encourage uh, a diverse community image uh, there. Um, and then I do worry about, uh, we, and we have heard with a prior concept review, uh, the impacts that we're going to be felt with the automotive service uh, business. Uh, a lot of those uh, you know, were around that appropriate transition between commercial and residential areas uh, that impact that neighborhood uh, surrounding that business. And I think a lot of those impacts uh, continue with this gas station, maybe uh, more, maybe some less maybe a little bit different, but there are definitely going to be impacts here. And so I don't think it meets that goal as well. So um, I would, uh, you know, I, I would hope that the, the landowner um, really goes back to that uh, commitment that they had made previously and looking at those retail uses uh, and, uh, and hopefully bringing forward, you know, a project that looks more like what they had pr proposed originally. Thanks, Mayor. That's all I have. Thank you. Council Member Lindstedt. Thank you, Mayor. I'll be brief. Um, I'm a firm no. Um, this feels like a bit of an about face from the deal that was previously agreed upon to approve those storage units. Um, and I think bringing uh, two different proposals that, that don't meet that criteria uh, kind of kind of poisons the well for me and um, makes me makes me think real hard about making deals on the dais uh, with landowners to get concessions for for, for on group uses. Um, in the future. So I'm, I'm a firm no, and I'm, I'm disappointed that we're having this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Leslie. Thank you, Mayor. Could we see that video again, please? I really appreciated your preparing that, and um, it would give me a little bit more insight into the site. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. I'm going to go along with my colleagues. I, I, I think the project is a great project. I think the renderings are, are great. We have a come down not too far from where we live, and it's very convenient. I just think it's the wrong place for it. So I'm going to vote no. All right. Thank you. Next is Council Member Lynn. Um, I would be a firm no if this project came before Council because it, um, I think it obviously 
violates the goals of the comprehensive plan um, for uh, providing diverse uh, diverse community image and a vibrant character to, uh, to the community. So um, I would be a no. Okay, yeah. member. Any other council member comments? Last call. Well, I I just want to say um, when I first got elected in 2017. My predecessor, one of my predecessors in Ward 5, actually knocked on my door um, to ask what was going on with the other part of the storage facility that they made the exception for on the, on the premise that there would be neighborhood retail. And I said, it's still an open lot. You know, well, just know the only reason we approved that was for the part two. Otherwise, we wouldn't have made that exception because really, who wants a storage facility in their backyard. So that has kind of stuck with me throughout the years that there was a commitment made to the neighborhood. And um, I have to agree with my colleague that this doesn't honor that commitment. So it's not your fault, unfortunately, that you kind of had to come bring this forth, but um, the memory is still pretty fresh from 2016 when this exception was made for that storage facility. And uh, I think that's why you're seeing the reaction that you are. Um, but I do want to refer to our city and county attorney, Nancy Rogers, on this is a concept review. It's not a public hearing. So the no's are not um, a vote. Yes, thank you, Mayor. And I, um, the way Councilmember Lynn uh, started her comments is exactly right. And I just want to clarify for those listening and watching tonight that if this project were to come forward, this is generally um, council's view of the concept. But if an application went forward, they would go through the hearing and consider it under our code. Um, and their indications tonight are not a formal vote on this matter. And the property owner could still submit an application. So I just want to make sure everybody's aware of that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Rogers. Um, so that's kind of all we have for you guys, unless there's anything else from anyone else. All right, well, thank you for being with us this evening. We're going to move on. Um, our only study session item this evening is an update on Broomfield development to provide an overview regarding tools available to ensure future residential development contributes towards a sustainable Broomfield. Council has a copy of the agenda memorandum, and I'll ask our staff to begin the discussion. Thank you, Mayor. Anna Burton Zetti, who's wearing a mask. I hope she's feeling all right. Yes, of course. I wouldn't be here. I sure appreciate that. Um, for um, Council and the community, this is um, the ongoing conversation uh, that started at the Council Retreat in March. Each Council meeting is setting up a study session, which will culminate in August for Council and the community to have a full breadth and depth understanding of where we are in our current development, what's in the pipeline, what we anticipate coming, costs associated, so that we can make some intentional decisions and recommendations to council as we move forward. Ms. Burton, ready? please walk us through this item. And Jeff Romine is also joining us tonight with uh, uh, field any additional questions with regard to development. Ms. Thank, Burton, you. Thank you, and um, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council. Um, I'm also going to be joined by Katie Allen. Um, she's joining remotely, so she'll finish the um, presentation for us this evening. Um, but uh, we are, as was mentioned, continuing this ongoing discussion um, tonight about building and about Broomfield, um, both uh, sustainably in terms of environmental and fiscal sustainability. Last month, we reviewed the approved developments and projects of the development pipeline, and then the purpose of tonight's focused um, study session was on residential development, as well as um, specifically on ways that Burnfield can help shape future residential developments, the tools that we have available to us. Um, and then, as I mentioned, Katie Allen, city and county engineer and the other co-director for community development, will talk about the um, impact on develop of development on public infrastructure. We can have two slides. Next one too, thank you. Um, so the staff memorandum provided a lot of additional information above what I'm going to include in my presentation this evening. Um, some of these suggestions in the staff memorandum are very specific, so I'll provide a more general overview as part of the presentation. 
The memo was formatted to go through um, all of the multiple guiding documents and regulations that help to shape future residential, um, both current and future residential development. That includes the municipal code, area plans, the building code, and then community-wide plans, such as the comprehensive plan um, and potential community-wide design guidelines. Some of the plans and codes or sections of the codes have not been updated in many years. In some cases, more than two decades. And as we look to the future, Brumfield is shifting towards higher densities, more infill development and redevelopment opportunities. There's also a renewed focus on environmental sustainability as well as that fiscal sustainability. In 2019, Brumfield hired an outside consultant to evaluate the current land use plans and the tools that we have available um, based on best practices in municipal planning. The assessment, um, although it did also involve stakeholders, resulted in useful recommendations, but these need to be paired together with city council's goals and priorities, as well as the community goals um, as identified in our comprehensive plan. Next slide, please. The memorandum, as I mentioned, included multiple references to potential updates. They spoke on that professional third party assessment that was completed, as well as recommendations that are coming from some of our um, advisory boards like leases and recent discussions and comments from the city council on development proposals. These recommendations include such things as updating application fees and residential development standards um, in terms of updating them within the municipal code. It can also begin to look at updating parking requirements that could be involving electric vehicle requirements, as well as looking at the current minimums and maximums for new development. In addition, the sub-area plans and neighborhood plans could be revisited in more detail to ensure they're consistent with those goals and as they may be shifting. Some examples to be included within the memorandum included the 120th Avenue corridor, as well as the I-25 area plan, since these will be key areas of focus moving forward. As was discussed at the last study session, we need to evaluate transportation networks and land uses to ensure the best balance for Brunfield's fiscal future. Other priorities, such as ensuring adequate densities to support bus rapid transit in particular areas and ensuring diversity in housing opportunities, can be incorporated more directly if these plans are to be updated in the future. The building code is also referenced in the memorandum as it is um, to be updated following our three-year historic um, cycle for updating building codes. The next update um, to the 2021 code will be considered by City Council next spring. Um, we're just beginning this process later this year. Strengthening amendments are likely to be requested and to move forward um, later in 2023 following adoption of the 2021 plan. I'm sorry, code. This would be the way that um, the recommendations that are coming from the ACES group could be incorporated into the building code. We find this process of the three-year cycle and separating the adoption of the building code and the strengthening amendments is the best process. It allows us focused review and feedback on each of those strengthening amendments. As part of the study session and feedback on these amendments, um, sorry, as part of this study session, feedback on these amendments will be helpful as staff resources will uh, need to be balanced as we bring forward um, these projects. Funds may be needed for outside consulting assistance, uh, depending on, on the complexity of the amendments or the updates. I'd like to now introduce Katie Allen to cover the next portion of the presentation. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, next slide, please. So I was asked to talk a little bit about growth and the impacts on infrastructure. So I'm going to start with potable water. Um, engineering staff works with a consultant to maintain a water model of Broomfield's uh, potable water distribution system. And the model allows us to run various scenarios such as average day demands or peak day or peak hour or fire flow um, to identify necessary improvements in the existing system. And maybe more importantly for tonight's discussion, it allows us to um, model future water demands in different areas of Broomfield um, to better understand what um, capital improvements are needed. So, what size pipes are needed and where, um, and other improvements to the distribution system. 
And when, when we have those capital improvements modeled and identified, it allows us to work with developers, such as Baseline, Vista Highlands, or Palisade, for example, to build out the distribution system through those developments and to coordinate construction. Um, and that's been something we've been uh, working on closely with Baseline recently. Um, Council will be seeing some reimbursement agreements um, from Baseline as well as uh, Vista Highlands to, to build out some of these trunk lines that allow us to deliver water um, in the future all the way to Northeast Broomfield. Um, next slide, please. So in addition to just expanding the, the pipe network, there are several other major water system improvements that are needed now, or at least in the very near term. Um, the first one on this chart, um, council probably recalls uh, very recently, um, you approved the first phase of construction for the Mesa Zone Water Booster Station. <clears throat> so this project is only partly growth related. Its primary purpose is resiliency and redundancy to provide water to the high elevation uh, water zones in Southwest Broomfield um, that are currently just ser served off of a single water booster station. Uh, the next one is the Sienna Reservoir um, pump station and pipeline. This allows us to deliver um, raw water to the water treatment plant. This can be considered an incremental storage improvement on the water supply side until the larger Broomfield Reservoir can be constructed. Um, and construction for this project um, is planned for 2023 to 2024. Um, the next project, which council is aware of, is the North Area Water Storage Tanks. Um, the cost information listed is, is just for the potable storage, the two potable storage uh, water tanks. Um, the project is also building a reuse water storage tank, however. Um, the distribution storage is needed to limit uh, pressure fluctuations in the system during peak hour and peak day demands. Um, and these projects are needed with, with the current growth and the current projects that are already in the pipeline. The next two projects listed are on the horizon. They have not yet been started, um, um, but we anticipate seeing those come um, forward in the next few years. One is the Broomfield Reservoir for additional raw water storage, as well as a, another expansion to the water treatment plant to 32 million gallons per day. Um, as some of you may recall, we just finished a 6 million gallon per day um, expansion of the water treatment plant in 2020. And I don't have a slide on the reuse water system. Um, as previously uh, discussed, we are designing and constructing a reuse water tank as part of the North Area Storage Tank um, projects to allow for uh, uh, peak storage use. Um, however, this system is not planned to expand beyond the baseline development, so it's not going to go north of Colorado 7 or east of I-25. Uh, next slide. Okay, so um, next I'll talk about the sanitary sewer system. Um, going back a little bit, um, there were two large capital projects in recent history that allowed Broomfield to grow um, generally north of 160th Avenue and east of Sheridan Parkway. And one of those was the North Area Lift Station, which is located just north of uh, Colorado 7 and west of I-25. That was built in 2013. And then the North Area Force Main, which was completed last year, which um, uh, pumps wastewater from that lift station to our plant um, off of 124th Avenue. Um, so all of Baseline, Vista Highlands, and Palisade drained to this lift station. It was really um, allowed for all of this growth to, to start in this area. Areas east of I-25 and north of Colorado 7 will need additional lift stations to um, serve those areas uh, with sanitary sewer service. And then those areas will be pumped back to the north area lift station and then pumped back uh, south to the wastewater treatment plant. There's also an area, a couple areas um, south of the Northwest Parkway to east of Huron Street that are also um, in their own basins that require lift stations 
um, for sanitary sewer service. These areas, uh, east of I-25 and these two areas um, on Huron Street, south, south of the Northwest Parkway have annexation agreements that oblige Broomfield to bring the water and sanitary sewer service. Um, so development timing in these areas will affect CIP budgets, um, um, particularly for the sanitary sewer service. And then lastly, as growth continues, Broomfield will need to expand the wastewater treatment plant. Um, we are required to start designing those improvements when the plant reaches 80% capacity and be done when the plant reaches 95% capacity. So based on forecasts, we will be starting, we will need to start design in 2024 and have those improvements completed somewhere between 2026 and 2032, depending on population growth. Uh, next slide, please. So residential impacts on uh, residential growth impacts on, on the transportation system is, you know, pretty intuitive um, with more um, drivers in Broomfield. Um, there will be impacts to all of the roadway system, not just the segments of roads adjacent to development. Um, some of the improvements you're forecasting in our five-year CIP project um, are are bridge widenings, um, such as um, the bridges over Northwest Parkway, so Sheridan Parkway, Huron Street, uh, Lowell Street, um, possibly interlock and loop bridge widening over US 36. And then the more routine capacity improvements that um, we identify on an ongoing basis, such as uh, intersection improvements, um, signals, and, and so on. And then next slide. So this was a pretty brief presentation with a lot of information. Um, hopefully um, the information will be helpful as we move forward through the next few months with continued discussions and consideration of potential action items. Um, staff prepared a general outline for key topics for upcoming meetings and uh, we welcome city council's feedback and direction regarding the items raised in tonight's study session, as well as the plan for future discussions. And I think with that, we will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for that presentation, Ms. Allen. Um, Ms. Bergadetti, is there anything else? All right. Uh, then does any member of council have any questions or comments? Council Member Shah? Uh, thank you, Mayor. So, uh, staff, thanks for this presentation. This is, uh, you know, I've, I've appreciated this conversation as it's, it's, it's rolled along, uh, going from a identifying a problem without a whole lot of conversation at that point, left me with a lot of anxiety. So, I'm glad to be moving forward in this conversation. Um, you know, I think that um, the, you know, the first thing that I have is I appreciate the, the kind of at the last slide, the projection of what those next steps are. One of those things on there is the building code updates uh, in the first quarter of 2023. And um, being on council previous, uh, being on council when we've approved these building codes previously, one thing that I was caught off the guard by was what that looked like and not having enough information when that finally came. And it's a lot of information. And I'm curious if we can have a study session to look at building codes at kind of a higher level before that first quarter of 2023, just so that we can get further information on what we have coming up uh, with that building code update. We do have that scheduled. Um, and this is where I, I, I miss my partner right here because she <laughs> is the scheduling guru and I have that date for you. Um, again, each one of these, to your point, Council Member Shop, is that building block. Uh, and although that, um, can we go back to that slide, please? Trying to keep it um, as, 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 I want to say as simple as we can, because that would not be managing expectations well, because there isn't anything simple about any one of these. Um, understanding the components, um, so you can see on the July 19th, the study session, each one, each one of these conversations, um, having a, a standalone um, um, regarding those building codes, You'll have bits and pieces, and I don't want to say bits and pieces as in it'll just be thrown together. Um, again, kind of weaving that story together. So 
you're not going to have a full bite when we go into those the, the design codes. You'll understand what they are, what the applications are, what the implications are, um, because those code updates will impact each one of those as we move forward. So the culmination really is that first quarter of 2023. Anna, add for me, please. Thank you. Um, yes, as was mentioned, um, we'll be talking about the billing fees in July. Um, we'll also be kicking out a community meeting with the billing community. And I believe that schedule um, may have included the exact date in the memo, but I think it was sometime from August, could be July, but around that time. And we can certainly work on the way that we present that data for you to make sure that we're really talking about um, and then helping to identify where the changes are, what's really changing between 2018 code and 2021, why are we going through this update? And so we'll work on that communication with you um, and see if there's a way that we can work that into one of our future study sessions, as was mentioned. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, and I guess it's it's not only so much between the uh, previous uh, building code update and the, the, and the one that is potential for us, but there's been a lot of conversations in the last two months uh, within our neighboring municipalities around building code standards and what those should look like, especially for as they're rebuilding in Louisville and Superior. So I just, I just wonder if there's not only room in conversation for what the differences are between those two building codes, but also what else can be uh, in that building code as well, and what considerations we should take, especially as we are in kind of a post um, Marshall Fire world, right? Thank you, Council Member Chef, for clarifying that for me. Um, so I think that that would be a great opportunity for us to do a study session on the strengthening amendments, which is really what we're seeing from a lot of our neighboring municipalities, um, looking at strengthening to help address the fire risk. Um, as well as addressing energy code um, often, which is coming out of ACES, some recommendations. So those we'll, we'll address separately, um, but it will be important for us to have a study session with city council before those amendments are brought forward. So we really understand what the community's um, target goal is because there's a wide variety of amendments that could be considered um, and a study session would be a great opportunity to get that type of feedback. So we bring back um, the co correct or best format um, for you to consider those amendments. Um, we would probably do that um, probably immediately or close to following um, adoption of the overall code. Okay, great. And the, the last thing, because I see that I have 39 seconds left, uh, is around growth limits on residential buildings. And I know that uh, Mayor Pro Tem just sort of speaks control in the timer. So it's, it's legit. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it's, it's um, that's right. Uh, and uh, so, so regarding the growth limits, uh, there's kind of different options. Uh, you know, different um, opportunities uh, to work with that um, now that it's fully aware, um, you know, what the ramifications are, what the opportunities are, everything. Uh, and so there's some different operate, uh, different opportunities for how to proceed with that ordinance. One of them is to remove it completely. One of them is to amend it. Um, so I'm curious, um, you know, um, Kind of what is staff's, uh, you know, kind of maybe not recommendation, maybe that's a little too strong, but um, uh, could you kind of point to me what kind of the direction um, is going to be kind of the preferable route to take uh, when we are in this, uh, you know, residential boom that we're, that we're experiencing here in Colorado, we have a shortage of housing supply um, where we continue to see housing prices continue to increase. Uh, so kind of how do we mitigate those factors uh, and not shut off residential building, but at, at the same point, uh, take care of our bottom line? And I'm going to feel that one. Okay. Um, we're not ready to have that conversation yet. There are other conversations that need to occur before, and, and we've all been on the receiving end. Of, um, there's a lot of folks that watch these meetings. Um, and the development community, um, particularly residential, is one of them. I've, I've uh, had outreach and engagement um, already. Having an uh, intentional um, decision makings about the why, as well as the timeline, it will be most critical. So what we do know is the next 36 months will be pivotal for Broomfield for all of the reasons, um, not sexy, um, and the fun whistles and blows, right? But, but the water, um, the infrastructure, CIP, shifting what we have had in place uh, for the last decade, which is 80-20, 80% on new um, and 20% shoring up 
what that fundamental base is. Um, over the next 36 months, we will be targeted strategically, structurally, shifting that percentage gradually, 60-40, 50-50, and then flipping 60-40 to ensure that time, effort, and energy are focused on those infrastructure needs. What that means is that will clearly impact decision-making that council will need to make on the front end. So as we talked about before, strategically, not only having the, the direction from council and the community while developers are coming in, um, but it allows us to be able to strategically target on the front end. What is it that we want to see where? And what does it look like in order to bring them in? What is the target for residential? We know that we're bringing on 6,000 units without having planned before bringing those 6,000 units on, what that impact to our capacity, wastewater, traffic, um, and, and, and the whole host of kind of the underbelly of what keeps a community strong. So we don't have recommendations on that other than it will fit under the category of intentional targeted, um, not long-term, but certainly short-term. Part of that will, um, will, will be informed by the rate study that we will be talking about. Um, we've, we've never had a, uh, a debt policy before this council passed the debt policy. We need to find out exactly where we are. So staff internally is working among um, all of the departments to understand what our obligations are now, because understanding what our obligations are now informs what our budget is going to be in 2023. So there's a lot of moving pieces that we need to have in place prior to making any recommendations. Um, the culmination, of course, as you look at, will, will, will be in August. So the goal is, as we move into 2022 on the fourth quarter, we know what the obligations are. We have a good sense of the revenue. We have a good sense of expenditures in 2023. We understand what the rate study um, looks like from water and sewer. Um, what those implications mean, uh, and then that will help us drive what the recommendations are to council, particularly with regards to residential. I know that's a long answer, council member staff, um, but again, we, we, want, we want to be very methodical um, as we walk up to the fourth quarter of, of, uh, of 2023, uh, 2022 rather, um, so that as we start on 2023, the community understands the direction we're going, Council is uh, supportive of the recommendations. And then internally, I can ensure that the staff structure uh, is built for um, executing that, particularly over the next 36 months. Uh, and thank you for that. I, I guess I'm trying to figure out where the, um, the growth ordinance conversation happens. And, and again, there's a whole lot on the screen, so maybe I'm missing it. Uh, but I see that there's a there's a public hearing and second reading on August 23rd. Uh, the uh, first reading and amendment is on August 9th. But when I look above that, I'm not seeing the conversation for the, the growth ordinance. Um, so so I guess I'm I'm trying to figure out how how we're going to get from tonight's conversation where we're not really discussing it to that first hearing in August. All first of, reading, I should say, not hearing. Yeah. No. So. All of those, all of those pieces that are that are um, prior to August 9th, part of the recommendation that you will see in the subsequent memos, um, and I'm I'm not giving this away. Um, staff has talked a lot about that growth ordinance. Um, we have not seen success in other communities. Clearly, we did not see success in this growth ordinance. Um, any ordinance um, um, and strategic plan is only as good as the execution of. Um, continue, I don't want to, you know, beat a dead horse. Um, and I hate that saying. I don't know why I said that. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think ever said that before. Um, um, you know, the recommendations on the, the water rates uh, uh, increases that uh, came in 2012. They're they're only as viable uh, as when we implement them, and we never did. So again, from a, a growth ordinance, um, we don't want it to be a fail safe. So it, the, the pendulum can't swing to all or nothing. Um, and that graduated tier structure 
It's difficult to do that. And so we have not seen other communities, all the conversations that we've had, for those that do have growth ordinances, it, it creates that pendulum. It is a fail safe. Um, we don't want to do that. So um, our recommendation is that, that we would get rid of the growth ordinance um, and we would not replace it with a different, more uh, a, a modified version of it, but rather have intentional structure on the front end to be taking control of our destiny, to be making sure that when a, whether it's a residential or a commercial developer, whether we shoulder tap them to bring them in, um, and that's part and parcel of our development matrix that we've worked for the last two years on. So that we can, again, really solidify um, bringing, bringing whatever that development is, and I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna throw a percentage with affordable housing out here. If our target was senior 50% of the AMI, we go and find a great developer that does, specializes in senior 50% of AMI. And we say, here's two spots that would be really ideal for you. How do we execute to make that happen? So uh, again, the end all be all is, is never the ordinance. Um, uh, it's all about the, the structure and the intentional decision makings on, on the front end. So with all of these um, pressure points, um, it will make for a, a, a comprehensive conversation um, that doesn't require the end all be all being in a growth ordinance. That when you hit that cap, and this is exactly, Council Member Shaft, what happened with this ordinance? You're going to hit the cap unless. This happens, and or this, or wait a second, well, maybe this, but maybe this too. Well, and then we'll do a waiver. So then pretty soon you lose track of what that what that essential mess of that ordinance is. All right, I have seven seconds left. So uh, I would say that I'm missing where uh, the concept reviews, getting rid of the concept reviews is on this and that conversation. Uh, and then that's all I have. Excellent. That's what we're, that's what we're I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, take a take a piece of that. Um, that the, the concept again. That's a, that's a much bigger conversation, um, and not necessarily a pointed conversation because again, as we move through each one of these, the need um, and the definition of why we do concept reviews will be flushed out. So a lot of these again, just because they're not. Um, topics of uh, specific conversations, they are woven through each one of these, each one of these pieces. Um, and the reason that's important is because by the time we get to the fourth quarter of 2022, the conversation won't be should we do concept reviews or not. The journey of having these conversations with LERP, what what's the, 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 the roles of just because we've always done concept reviews, should we continue to do concept reviews? I mean, we just had one, and um, oftentimes that um, we can use that as an example as, as we move forward for, for defining what the purpose of that is. And is there another way to do it that is more efficient for the developer, for council, and for the community? Yeah, I think Westminster is going to be adding a concept review to their development review project. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Lim. I guess um, I'm glad to see the EV uh, ordinance is coming forward already on July 12th. That's wonderful. Um, ACES uh, handled this. I was there at the at their meeting last Monday and made a counter offer, let's say, um, to what we see in the staff's EV parking guidelines. So, will we? Is that still under? Discussion, what we'll, we'll, we will see on July 12th. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to clarify that, Council Member Lim. So um, the sustainability staff at the last ACES meeting provided an update to ACES to talk about the guidelines that we currently have in use. Um, and they provided that feedback back that, um, that these could be updated. And they had some suggestions. And we actually are working with the sustainability staff to have additional information at the June meeting. So that was more of an introduction, kind of the background of this is what we're currently doing in terms of trying to make recommendations to the development community. 
And then now staff is doing more background research and will be starting the draft of the ordinance, of the potential changes, and we'll bring back that specific information to ACES to get feedback. Um, so there'll be another opportunity for ACES to provide more specific targeted feedback to the ordinance itself, um, since it will be perhaps a little different than what the guidelines have been. Okay, great. Um, in updating the building codes, will there be some discussion at that time already in anticipating future compliance with what is, well, I guess the governor didn't sign it yet, but what what was passed by the legislature in 1362. So probably not as part of the, the overall um, adoption um, that we would see first in 2023, 20, <laughs> sorry. Um, but yes, in terms of um, if we were told a study session and start talking about strengthening amendments, that would be that time that we would probably need to talk about how this works in with the goal of 2026, I believe is what, what that um, had for the targeted adoption date. So um, how the strengthening amendments could build and prepare us and the development community that's working in Brookfield for that um, additional adoption and additional amendments that would come in 2026. Good. Um, there was a suggestion to um, start looking at the I-25 sub area plan, um, which you know seemed like a good idea as far as focusing on the environmental and fiscal sustainable sustainable land use. But when I looked at the map, I thought, well, well, that doesn't define the undeveloped areas. It includes Anthem, it includes a corner of wild grass. I mean, would you can would it be possible to redefine the I-25 subarea plan the area before you updated that subarea plan? Councilmember Lynn, that's exactly what we think needs to happen. Um, we have a lot of development area west of I-25 that's included in that area plan, and it just isn't very applicable to those areas. What we'd like to have a focus on is more of um, what came on in the last study session is what is the correct balance of land use in those yet to be developed or currently undeveloped areas, probably from Huron Street working east, and then also looking at the transportation network, including Sheridan. Okay, that makes more sense. Good. Um, I was surprised at the dates, the specific dates given for the Broomfield Reservoir. Um, I had, as far as that it would be, construction would be needed 20, by 27, 28. I had just asked in September of 21 um, about, well, that was in the context of the Sienna Reservoir pump station where the Broomfield Reservoir fit in. And I had looked at the webpage for the Sienna Reservoir, for, well, for what was then the Broomfield Reservoir page. And it said at the time that it would provide seasonal summer storage um, in the future. Well, that the Sienna Reservoir would provide seasonal summer storage for the next 10 to 15 years until the Broomfield Reservoir is needed. So 10 to 15 years is 31 and forward, not 27, 28. So that was just the what was on the web page in September. So is are we seeing a different need or what is the missing piece here in this update? I can ask um, Ms. Allen if she could answer that question. Um, thank you, Councilmember Lim. So I guess I would answer that in two ways. The Sienna Reservoir was originally targeted to come online by 2017. And so when the report, I think was talking about 10 years it was using from that date, um, but all of these are projections and our water resources group tracks what we call tap equivalents or water licenses that are sold. And then they reproject um, and the, the date on the slide um, is their conservative but realistic projection based on current growth rates for when that reservoir would be needed. So it's something we have to keep looking at um, on an ongoing basis. Okay, I guess the only thing I would, since, since I know a lot of the area I represent looks and at the um, city's 
information about the Broomfield Reservoir. I guess I would just ask, is there a more like, is there a greater likelihood that it's going to be constructed in 27 or 28 that we should put that on the web page now that it's in a memo? Um, I guess that would be my question. Councilmember Lim, I'll, I'll field that one. I, I can tell you, um, uh, and, and, and I'm not hedging to be to be diplomatic. Um, the last four months, um, the, the focus over the last two years fundamentally has been literally and fundamentally nothing but surviving COVID. What we have discovered, me personally, as your leader um, over the last four months um, has been a real eye-opening experience for all of us. And part of uh, when teams begin to um, not work in their avenues and lanes, we understand um, how Anna's number of permits from the approval process uh, impacts the amount of engineering, which then impacts the amount of staffing and everything else. Not having an internal structure that had the capability to move from a linear into a comprehensive structure is what we have been focusing on every day for the last four months. So discovering that there was a statutory, a statutory requirement that when we reached a certain capacity um, in our wastewater, that we had to go into design phase, um, moving right through design into build phase without having any capability to have that in our CIP budget. So uh, again, a lot of our internal mechanisms and structures are growing up rapidly. Um, thus, all of these conversations, um, discovering what so many of the business development agreements um, everything's coming home to roost right now. So all of those business development agreements that were made in the North, excuse me, 10 years ago, um, are now being calculated and planned for. Um, the second piece to that is, is absolutely updating the webpage, but that, that, that has not been a priority. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad that we have a, we feel, I appreciate the fact that we, that staff has spent um, a necessary amount of large amount of time on COVID and that we have a better handle that, that you've grappled with those issues in a different way now. Um, post, you know, without having to spend so much time on COVID. So I appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to confirm that that my yeah. understanding was correct. That will be information that my neighborhood would want to know. Um, I'm grappling with the issue of um, Density is better in residential versus the cost of each resident. Um, and I guess that's a conversation for the future, but in some respects, it isn't a conversation too far off. I, I absolutely agree. I too am grappling, uh, as, is, as, as, as is staff. And, and that's, that's the complexity um, of, of what it looks like on paper and what, and what we think it's going to be um, and what we can anticipate is so much different than what it actually turns out to be. Um, and that should, that shifts our uh, priorities um, or should, right, uh, um, into a, a much more uh, intentional decision making about redefining what that looks like. Um, particularly now because we have costs associated uh, with, with, with darn near everything that we're doing. And, and that in and of itself is a seismic shift. Um, yeah, um, we, we, we're grappling with it as well, Councilman Lim, and, and uh, I, I, I appreciate the comment. Okay, thank you. I think that's my time. Thank you. Next is Council Mayor Marshall. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so a few comments and a couple questions. Um, I appreciate the staff putting this all together. Um, coming on the council, um, it really is trying to drink from a fire hose, trying to keep up to speed on everything, especially when 
we have an office come forward that I did, I wasn't part of the original the concept reviews or the initial conversations. So trying to figure out where everything fits and how it all looks as a comprehensive unit is important. And I think this this format that you put together is very helpful. Um, I agree with a lot of what um, I'm seeing here. I, I think it's it's beneficial um, that we move forward in a comprehensive way. Um, one question I had was on the um, wastewater treatment plants. Um, I know that we, when we reach a certain capacity, we have to fill expand. Does that involve expanding the existing facility, or does that involve building a second facility or additional facility up north, for example? Miss Allen? And, that's, and this is really, and, and, and so we, we defer so much to, to, to Katie Allen. She's, she's like the, a, a sage. Um, and it's really, um, um, it's really public works question. Um, so Ms. Allen, as, as, as much as you can from the meetings that we've had, if you can just kind of anecdotally answer that, that would be super helpful. Um, yes, thank you for that, Jennifer. I'm not the expert, but my understanding, it's primarily expansion of the solids handling system in the existing facility. It's not a new system. So it's the digesters and um, dewatering systems. Primarily. Okay, and so what would be the way, how would we be mitigating the impact to the neighboring community from that expansion? I, I you know, that facility is in, in Wood One, and I've heard from, you know, the neighbors there that at times there is smell that is resulting from that. And so if we're going to expand it, what is the mitigation going to be? We'll get to that. Um, yeah, I live right across the street. And um, so, uh, yeah, and, and it's more and, and it's more and it's more frequent. Um, uh, the mitigations will, will continue to, uh, to, to evolve. Um, first and foremost, when we know that it's triggering, uh, it's, it's, about the, it's about the financing. These are big ticket items. Um, um, in, in some respects, bonding, and the, and that's why it's it's so important for us to have the conversation. So it's not so the rate study isn't um, council member uh, Marshall Shinfi. The rate study conversation isn't just about delivering the water, right? It's about what do we have, um, and 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 the mayor has been talking about this for um, five years now, um, from that debt capacity perspective. Um, so that's why it's so all, all of those um, all, all of those questions with regards to uh, capacity. That's why it's so important that the intentional decisions are made on the front end because we know that if you make these decisions to add additional residences, what that ripple effect is going to be. Um, and once we from from that expansion perspective, um, then it falls into um, Anna's. Um, less about the, the engineering and the financing uh, and so much more about the, um, how do you build it safely? What are the, you know, what's the pain point and how long are you gonna have to be in pain before you can get some relief? Thank you. Um, on the, the utility rate discussion, what are discussions happening within staff about the drop conditions that we're finding ourselves in probably before ever, we're gonna be having for a while um, and the water usage and the rates and I mean, nobody wants to talk about a tiered um, usage. We do. But um, the West Minister doesn't like talking about that. But um, what, what is the internal conversations on that right now? Um, thank you uh, for that question. And I know these don't seem like really fun conversations, but I can tell you, they, they're, they're fascinating conversations. Um, yeah. We, we, Without getting into a really uh, to a significantly deep dive, um, um, and I don't want to mention the uh, I don't want to mention the other community um, because again I get the, the city managers and the deputy city managers sending me these text messages after I leave here saying why do you use this as an example? So I can say that we um, we are in much better shape than our neighboring communities, and we want to stay that way. And part of staying that way um, oftentimes means uh, making difficult decisions. Uh, and so really the policy discussions are um, how much pain over how long a period of time. 
and then being committed to the community that when there are recommendations made, we follow those recommendations because if we don't, again, the culmination of not having done a lot of these difficult things, at some point you're gonna to have to do it and, 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 and that kicking the can. I don't know how we don't do a tiered system. Council Member Marsh Wilson, um, those that use more water will pay more. Um, the, that also allows us and drives us to have additional educational conversations about what conservation means um, and what it looks like um, and, and incentivizing um, a, a multitude of, of possibilities. I understand that the legislature does approve additional funding for um, going away from grass, basically. Yes. Okay. Um, shifting quite my question off of uh, space water and water, um, I was happy to see that there was discussion about um, re looking at the I 20 core mm -hmm. sub area plan, even though it hasn't been 20 years. Mm -hmm. Unlike uh, I 25, where there's a lot of undeveloped land. I, 120 is really need, there's a lot of areas that are going to need redevelopment. Mm -hmm. So, what is the process going to look like on updating that plan? And as far as community involvement, and okay. thank you for your question. Um, I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, if that was a direction that council wanted to go and look at updating um, for potential redevelopment uh, focus. 120th corridor, and would really have to partner probably with some type of an outside agency to help us um, with the outreach. Um, we would lean on them happily to help identify a good engagement plan there because we need to reach out to businesses, property owners, and then the residential communities uh, surrounding the area. So that would require a lot of engagement, just like all of our redevelopment efforts um, and infill projects. There's a lot of interest in that area. So we need to make sure that we have all of those, um, the input and opportunities for it as it progressed. Thank you. I would definitely support that, um, especially the, the Sheridan in 120, for example, that complex is aging in the parking lot is often in disrepair. So I would appreciate that. My last comment is because I'm running out of time, you know, your pro temperature doesn't always stop it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <is>, <laughs> Um, just as a, as a note, um, when we're talking about the growth ordinance, um, I understand we're not getting that conversation yet, but um, we actually have two more minutes. I only put three minutes on the. No, not really. <laughs> um, I would support repealing the growth ordinance as, as it is now. I don't see the point of having it, and I don't think it does what we want to do anyway. So um, I want to take every, I mean, I do believe that we need to take development as a holistic approach and not approve things that are not. Exactly what we need, especially since we're coming up on you know build out. So, um, but I don't think that the growth ordinance is what we need. So, I was totally for that too. So, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I'm going to use 15 seconds um, of, of the two minutes. Um, Councilmember Marshall should we'll we'll have additional dialogue about um, um, the activation on 120th when we begin to talk about the urban renewal authorities um, and the financing capabilities that you have with an urban renewal authority. Um, and it also, um, we'll talk about it when we are um, discussing <laughs> when we're, um, um, I'm going to disregard that and I'm just going to keep on going. Um, when we talk about the debt ratio, um, the 120th URA um, has, uh, we've taken about $30 million from the 120th URA to pay the first bank center. URA. Um, so again, it's it kind of case in point of although it's not specifically topic driven, a lot of these conversations will will have overlap. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have the council member Anderson. All right, thank you. I drove my five minutes, so I appreciate that. Um, all right, so one one piece here, I. I say I really appreciate um, staff pulling this all together so you can really see the water infrastructure and the um, transportation and road improvements and, and all these expenses that are coming. This is super helpful. And this conversation is happening more in the realm of ACES, but this whole, I would love to see more of a discussion on the um, 
sustainability as it relates to EVs and solar panels and transit and do we need more transmission line capacity eventually? Are we getting enough solar panels on roofs? And and you know, where are we at with the metrics? And I'm assuming that's coming um, in, in that realm, but that's that's a conversation I'd love to see more of to make sure we're on here on target to um, hit those metrics covered with our goals there. And so I guess my only question, this is all great information, but um, we're, we're talking about that residential cap. And if I look at the, um, uh, the, growth, the growth cap there, and if I look at the Atham area and baseline, and if, and, and if you drive up into that area, and there's an explosion going on right now of, of development, and you look around there, I mean, hundreds of homes are going in each year, I guess maybe thousands, I mean, thousands. And so I think like, we are, you know, the schools are this, you know, at the Thunder uh, Vista School was, it seemed like it had so much capacity and it's filling up. And, and you know, we're looking at all these roads need to be expanded. And I appreciate, you know, Sheridan's already been expanded. We're going to be paying the price a little bit at the moment, 60 closes in that area because we're losing a main road through. And so we're feeling it up there. Like, in other parts of Broomfield, you might not notice it, but that's where so much of that development is happening. And when we look at that growth cap, I hear from people saying, why are we growing so fast? And then we also have this conversation you brought up so many times where it's like, you know, residential doesn't, the tax revenue from residential doesn't pay the way. And so if we remove that residential growth cap as some are in favor of, can we tie it into a commercial trigger? I thought that was a discussion we were going to have here in this near term of, of if we're not, if we're going to just like grow, residential growth, grow or exempt multifamily residential, and, and we want to maintain our service level, which I know, I know people might um, or want to maintain. How does that work? Because we're not seeing the commercial come in baseline yet. We're not seeing the services. So that I would love to hear more about that thought process on how, how do we get that side to catch up? You bet. And um, um, really great questions. I, I uh, and, and and the reason it, it makes me happy, even though the answers aren't aren't super positive. Um, is because I know that we're in alignment with council because these are the these are the exact conversations that we're having. So, so here's a here's a, the difficulty, Councilmember Anderson, particularly up north, is the the development agreements that were put in place um, long before those that are sitting on this uh, on, on on the bench right now um, weren't there weren't triggers that were put in place with the business development agreement. Um, we did put them in place with flat irons. Uh, and by that, I mean, so for, for X number of residential square footage, you have to deliver X amount of commercial. Um, those triggers are not in place up north. Um, we just had a, a, a meeting with uh, McWinney. Um, they were supposed to come to you all um, next week, as a matter of fact. Um, and we took a look at the plans and said, you need to rework some things. Part of our um, forecasting that we build in is based on what they believe they can make happen. When they can't make that happen, we need to adjust on the back end as well. And we have not done that historically. So um, we keep talking about the, the, the five year, the, the, the five, the, the long range financial plan, um, only being balanced every five years. It's like balancing your checkbook every five years. It doesn't work like that. So part and parcel of making these decisions on the front end is having the structure in place to recommend to you all what those, what that criteria should be on the front end. So again, it shouldn't take an ordinance for that growth cap because you've had an ordinance and there hasn't been a growth cap. It hasn't been practiced since 2005. So what we need to do is understand, come, and, and not to continually repeat myself, but we have to understand where the obligations are right now. There isn't, a, there isn't an inventory. Um, well, we're close to, to, to having an inventory, but it's, it's taken us a couple of months in order to figure out what all of those business development agreements are, what the vested rights mean, 
what they have the capability to do and where we can intercede on that. Um, it's difficult up north, I can tell you that. And, and, and so when the market studies don't support what they originally thought that they could deliver, they adjust. And that means we have to adjust. Um, so that's 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 where we that's where we are right now. So there's there's a lot that we cannot control um, and being creative about how we can get out in front of what that mechanism looks like and still be good partners um, uh, and, and welcome intentional development as 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 we move forward. But but just saying no. Um, we have the capability to do that in some areas. Up north, we don't. Okay, so that really doesn't answer the question of if I, I mean that's like that's an ongoing discussion of with all this residential growth and no commercial development, how do we maintain service levels? I guess that's the big question. That is the the question that that's just disturbing me just a little bit well, is that I have a chance really for more housing, but we I, I don't know a, a single resident who says I'm okay with my service level going down. I'm okay if we don't, you know, if we're not sure you know we come to rely on we were talking about increased mowing. You know, it, it's like that was always a concern up um in the in the north and especially now we're understanding even more the importance of ensuring that mowing west of Antler Ranch and the highest mitigation areas and everybody wants a road plow and everybody wants but they want all these services. So yeah. I, I guess I'm not I'm not in favor of bringing the growth cap. I'd rather enforce a growth cap until we find a way to get the commercial to stay in line with it because what good is a ton of housing they run the services? I'll just leave it at that. I, I, it's a it is it should it should be disturbing. It should be disturbing to every uh every single person that's here and listening in, in this community. So that is I, I know we need a solution, we don't have it tonight and like, about that. We're, so, we're getting there. <laughs> so thank you. That's not my questions. All right. Thank you. Council Member Hankel. Thank you, Mayor. Sorry, I don't know why I was surprised I was next. Um, thank you, staff, for this. You guys have really mapped out quite a bit for us, and I really appreciated it. I'm not going to belabor my points too much. Um, I do have just a few questions um, for everyone. Um, I'm just curious. On um, first of all, when we go through things, you know, certain infill things too, I'm noticing too, so I'm very thankful for this. I'm noticing too, we have like it seems like a thousand variants. So I'm like, what the heck? We have so many variances. What is wrong with our code? So I'm very happy that we're looking at this, and I'm very, um, I'm looking forward to, to seeing, you know, where we can make things uh, more malleable, but not to the point where we're sacrificing. Uh, you know, to Council Member Anderson's point, the service level that we have. So I think that's I think that's the gathering point where I think a lot of us are at. So I appreciate this and sort of the mapping out um, of what this is going to look like. Um, so, so sort of high level, how are we um, mapping this out exactly? So I noticed it looks like maybe we have some low hanging fruit at first, and we're developing more and more and more to things that are just more complicated and more complex that will take you know, more thought processes. And would those later decisions like in September or August or what we're looking at be reliant upon what we say in July or whatnot? Is that what, is that, I just want to know like the mindset behind setting this up. So Council Member Hinkle, some of the, um, some of them are a little bit low hanging fruit, like you said, the EV charging stations we've heard for years, we have developers working on it. Um, ACES is very interested in, getting us some recommendations on what we've been doing with the guidelines. So we feel like that can move very quickly. Other um, items, like you said, we'll have to build on later discussions. Um, for example, the financial discussion that's coming in July might need to occur beforehand. Um, and then some of it is, um, it will require additional outreach either through the community um, or specifically to the development community, or um, it could be particular um, to uh, the Open Space and Trails Advisory Committee or something else where um, we really need to build that time frame a little bit more before we can say um, a specific, we're going to bring this forward in August. So it's a little bit in flux as we continue to have these discussions and get feedback. 
Um, and then a little bit of, of identifying what is the priority coming out of these discussions so we can focus our staff sharing them first. Mm -hmm. That's great. I like it that we're taking all sorts of stakeholder input. <laughs> I feel like that's really important. Um, and I'd like to see just, and I don't know how tangible this comment would be, but I would like to see just how, you know, maybe a public land dedication would affect other things or whatever we're talking about. What does that domino effect? Um, maybe it would affect parking or, or whatnot. I don't know. Um, and then on top of that, I did notice that we do have the update on the inclusionary housing ordinance, which I do appreciate. Um, I feel like it is uh, still really amazing, but I do feel like it needs some improvement as far as we really need doors. Um, and I noticed that I believe it said the ordinance called for review every two years. Uh, which is currently being completed by the housing division with recommendations coming to council. Is that a minimum of two years or is that like a trigger or is that a maximum of two years? When is that, can we do it sooner than two years? It's probably specific to two years, but I would uh, imagine that the council could consider it at, at any time in that. You could consider it yearly, but the code is very specific that it needs to be done um, every two years. Okay. And what is our, um, uh, housing authority looking at when they're, you know, looking at this inclusion inclusionary housing ordinance. Do we know what that plan is? I'm going to ask if one of our housing um, staff looks like Mr. Romain is going to join us. Uh, hi, I'm Jeff Romine, uh, Director of Vacuum Vitality, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council Members. So on the inclusionary housing ordinance, the way that, that it was originally written called for the, um, the hack to actually make the recommendations and change. Since we no longer have a hack, uh, we're going through and we'll be making those updates and those recommendations. We have a consultant in place. We'll be getting a report from them. We are going to be meeting with the Bloomfield Housing Authority, providing them an update and asking them for their for their response and, and some of their items for consideration. So they don't have a role as far as formal approval. Um, it's something that will be reserved for you. The second part is going back a little bit to your uh, earlier part of the conversation. In, in talking with the city county manager, what we're going to do is restructure the way that that ordinance basically sits. So rather than having an ordinance that's incredibly detailed, the ordinance will set it up and they'll reference to guidelines. And so what we can do is have the greater degree of detail in the guidelines, and that will allow us to update it on a more regular basis for some of the detail side of it, which is the application side, we'll say, and some of those other things. So it won't be quite set up the way it is, and that's how most other communities have done it, in order to provide the, the, the timely flexibility in order to move forward. Um, and so that's what's really coming. Um, and again, that's scheduled for uh, July 12th. At that point, I would um, foreshadow to you that we would be focusing on some variation within it, uh, the structure of it, thinking about the AMI levels as an example, making sure that they're appropriate, um, and then also thinking about the cash and move. Uh, many of you who've been on council for uh, both this year as well as um, over the last couple of years have recognized many developers have come forward and said, you know, taking the cash and move option, as opposed to, as you pointed out, providing doors. Okay, thank you. I think that's all the questions I have at this time. Thank you. All right, thank you. Council Member Ward in the ether. <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Um, again, I, I would like to thank staff as well for preparing this and putting concisely on one document all of the upcoming first readings, second readings, and uh, future study sessions. So it's plain as day. Uh, one of the first questions I have is in regards, um, in the memo it states, you know, you have example code requirements that we may or may not be looking at changing. I know we already have the EV charging, parking minimums versus maximums in there. Um, where, where would that bike infrastructure um, fall under? Would that be more of the um, would that be another item we have to add? Because I see it says uh, on the next steps slide, August, September, October, we can have additional first and second readings as directed by council. 
or would that fall under more of building codes um, or some other section? Thank you, Council Member Ward. Um, we expect that some of the bicycle facility um, parking requirements will come forward as a um, potential code amendment to the parking requirements of Title 17 of the Municipal Code. Um, we haven't um, <laughs> fully started the research into parking facilities and what all of that could encompass. So you're right, some of it may um, be cut out and, and come forward with other types of amendments, whether that's design guidelines or subarray plan guidelines in specific areas where it's most appropriate. Um, but there would definitely, um, based on this um, table, be something that can be addressed in Title 17 if that's what council wanted to um, direct staff to do. Um, we just haven't gotten um, into the details of the research yet, but that would be forthcoming and then we'll set a schedule for that as well. All right, thank you. and. In addition to that research, you guys had mentioned like with the EV uh, charging stations and parking, you talk with the ACES committee. Um, is that something you also bring up with ACES or the Broomfield Transportation Forum or some other entity within the city and county of Broomfield? Or how does that uh, community engagement also uh, factor in? That's a great question, Councilmember uh, Ward. We really haven't um, started looking at the engagement process for that particular code amendment. Um, we've already identified ACES as a stakeholder. Um, we will likely have a Bloomfield voice page and seek input. Um, we sometimes go through um, social media in order to get the word out on, on items that are citywide. We'll need to work on um, what the engagement looks like for each of these amendments as we move forward and what might be appropriate. Um, but we haven't identified a particular um, group of stakeholders yet for each of them. Okay, thank you. And then um, I know one of the items on page uh, four, I guess, of the uh, memo that was sent out was talking about adding a mixed use zoning district. Could you kind of just briefly explain what that means and what all in is encompassed in that new district? Thank you for the question. So this was one of the items identified by our professional assessment of the code that stated that we currently do not have a mixed use district. So the only way to develop in Broomfield with a mix of uses is to propose a planned unit development. And in that case, there really isn't a good code comparison of where to start with. So there's no baseline established for what our minimum expectations are for a mixed use district, what uses we'd like to see, what type of transition, how the parking is handled. And so establishing a mixed use district will provide that basis and then could be utilized either as an option or alternative to a PUD, or it will give us a background um, to say as a PUD plan comes forward that is unique for a project, how it compares to the baseline established um, standards that we have for our mixed use district in the code. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for that answer. And then my last question is gonna be in regards to um, the updating the public land dedication requirement. Um, I did see it was not, unless I'm misreading the uh, timeline, I didn't see that necessarily in the timeline. So is that something that we're just not viewing as uh, quite as imperative as some of these other um, changes to the code? Or um, are you looking for more council direction on that type of um, change? Again, thank you for your question because it's a good clarification. The public land dedication update is, is imperative. It really plays into all of this and how it relates to inclusionary housing and all of the requirements for residential development. The reason we didn't have a timeline specifically identified is because it's the open space and trails, um, I'm gonna get the name wrong, open space parks and recreation and trails master plan is currently getting updated and it's within that document that we have the guidelines for public land dedication. So through that process, they're looking at recommendations for updates to the public land dedication, and then that would be brought forward to city council, um, kind of in a parallel but separate process. Okay, thank you so much. I, I don't have any further questions, Mayor. All right, thank you. Council Member Lentzett. Thank you, Mayor, um, and thank you, staff, for putting out this roadmap. Um, as we, we, we try to look at everything um, comprehensively. Um, 
I, I guess my one word of word of caution would be as we're looking at things comprehensively, make sure we're looking at, at everything. Um, and I don't necessarily mean uh, just the financial piece of it. I mean, what does what what do we want our housing stock to look like when we're at build out? You know, um, do we how does this interplay with our, our multimodal priorities on Highway Seven um, and the, the required density that we'll need up there? Um, so all this stuff is intertwined. Um, you know, one each every requirement or fee you put on a new development um, might have a trade off somewhere else. Um, so I just I, I, I want people to be thoughtful um, when they're when they're looking at all these things about the outcomes that they they will actually produce because looking at this and looking at the chart that was in the, in the memo i mean it, all these things seem really 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 great uh but we gotta we gotta make sure we're thinking about how they all um will interplay together um as we we're, we're looking at those those outcomes because i think um you know it it, it, it might not make a whole lot of sense to, to up our our ihop and and increase our land dedication and enforce a growth cap i don't, I don't think that's going to lead to the, the type of development we want so um that's just my, my word of word of caution you know we, we're, we're approaching build out we don't have a ton of control over everything but um you know I, I, as always my priority has been, been getting that diversity of housing um so i, I think it's, it's it's just just important to look at look at this from from all uh, possible outcomes um so um i appreciate the schedule i think the schedule right here um uh, makes a lot of sense um and uh i i really look forward to august 23rd when we hopefully repeal that birth ordinance so that's all i got thank you Mary. thank you very much council member lindsay thank you mayor let me weigh into this is huge uh and, and i want to compliment uh, uh, city manager hoffman and her team and the mayor as well for holding the retreat uh, back in February and setting the stage in a broad way so that we had a sense of, uh, of change is coming. Uh, I think uh, you set a, a really powerful agenda. This seems like small stuff. This is a lot of minutia involved here, but the overall uh, outcome is going to be uh, substantial for uh, Broomfield, for our future, for our residents. And I, I'm just very appreciative of the way you've all laid this out, that you set this up over a period of time so we're not overwhelmed in, you know, in one meeting to try to understand all this. I know there'll be more than the meetings that we've already defined uh, that probably we'll need to, to have to discuss some of this further. But I just feel that this is a signal moment for Broomfield, and I just wanted to compliment all of you. For that, I did have one question. It was mentioned um, earlier in the presentation that there had been a consultant study, I think, in 2019. I don't know if that study is still relevant. Uh, if we could get a copy of it, if it's useful, if it's no longer relevant, and you know you're moving beyond that, then don't you know don't bother. But if it is relevant, I'd certainly uh, appreciate your making it available to us. Um, Councilmember Leslie, the housing. Um, or I'm no, sorry, it was the code. I think it was oh, the code. Um, yeah, the zoning amendment. Okay. I'd be happy to speak to that. So the zoning amendment was done in 2019, and a lot has happened in our community That's since 2019. So we would be happy to provide in maybe one of the updated study sessions some of the key findings. But I would caution with sharing it because it really doesn't take into consideration some of the key priorities. It does not prioritize environmental sustainability which is one reason that we never did present it to city council because even after it was completed we realized it was much more of a professional assessment it gave us a great opportunity to look at it and see ways that could be improved but it didn't look at it through the lens of our priorities and what could be changed or should be changed first in terms of priorities and so it, it's one of those if you look at it without that context you might be like well why is that identified and not looking at environmental concerns. Yeah, that's why I said if it's not relevant any longer. I know 19 it seems is, like it just a couple of years ago, but it's actually a it's, couple of years ago. Very Things helpful tools for staff. So it was a good investment okay, in terms of identifying some sure. areas for us. Okay. Um, but I, I don't think it is um, specific to this conversation. OK, well, if there's any relevancy, you can sort of share that with us. But I, I just didn't want to leave it sitting there without uh, knowing whether it could give us some framework, if not, 
that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Jim. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm going to be pretty, pretty brief. We do appreciate the, the schedule and sort of gives us an idea of what's coming up in the next six to 12 months. Uh, the things that stick out for me are, are definitely some of the bigger picture things. Uh, as Councilmember Marshall also mentioned, uh, the sub area plan amendments, particularly on 120th, I think that's a, that's, that's a big one. Uh, so looking forward to, to seeing that on the, the agenda. The, the mixed use district, I think, is pretty important too. I don't see, maybe I missed this. Is there a time period when that's going to be looked at? I didn't catch if it was on the, on the back steps. We do not have that yet identified. It's one of those that will require quite a bit of research. Um, and we we just needed to prioritize them first. But we will we will be working on timelines for all of the amendments that Trump would like to move forward. Yeah, yeah I think it's a Will be an interesting discussion. And as a council member Lindstedt pointed out, I think the, the big thing you know, is uh, and all these, especially the, the smaller low hanging fruits uh, items that are coming up in the next few months. And to quote council member Lindstedt, you know, the outcomes that we want, so every decision that we make, um, it's going to impact other decisions. So, are we clear or are staff clear as to what we want? You know, what are the outcomes that we're looking for? Or does that need to be? And I know that we sort of talked about it a little bit at our study sessions and sort of have ideas of what we want. No, no, that's what I was afraid of. Um, and, and when we start having those conversations, all of us uh, will be doing jazz hands because by having those conversations, it means that we have a structure in place internally to support the decisions of council. And it means that we have a really good handle on where we are from a revenue perspective, from an expenditure perspective, from what's in the pipeline perspective, and how we make that fundamental shift. It kind of goes back to a little bit about what, what Councilmember Anderson was saying was, we have to ensure that our residents that are here right now have what and why they came here. So we have got to shore up our base and our fundamentals. And then we can start and, and, and as soon as we do those things, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, then we can start talking about what, how do, how do we then prioritize now that the foundation is secure? So should we be doing that first, you know, going through all of these next steps, and it sounds like that should be the first thing that we're doing before we even touch anything else, because I think those are the, the big picture questions that we need to, to be very clear on. You know, as Councilmember Anderson mentioned, you know, Maintaining services is a, is, is a big issue for a lot, a lot of residents, but you know, if we go about start doing um, A, B, and C, maybe the services can be maintained. So I think we need to find out exactly what are what are our, our big picture goals, and then that will, like as you mentioned, guide you know, hopefully everything else after that. So should that be the first step? It's kind of the chicken and the egg. Um, but from a from a from a leadership perspective. We have to understand what our current obligations are, not what the goals are, not what the priorities are, not what we want to do next. What are we obligated to do right now? What is the revenue that we have coming in right now? What is the expected expenditures? Because again, that's the shift over the last 18 months has been, we're not budgeting by expenditures anymore. Right, we're not doing the kind of balancing the budget on the back end. Part and parcel of that requires us to shore up that understanding. We don't have that understanding. Staff, your staff does not have the understanding of those three fundamental premises right now. So we need to do that first. And once we do that, because we know if we're obligated for it, we know how much the sewer costs, we know how much the water costs, we know how much the roads cost, we know what the services that our community has become accustomed to costs. We know what the infrastructure costs. So we need to look at both of those, compare those to the revenue that we have coming in before any additional conversations are had. I guess that's what I'm hearing in agreement and I'm kind of wondering why we should be even having a lot of these conversations on the next steps because it sounds like the first step is to you just mentioned is to find out what we're obligated to. And I think that sort of helps guide the, the overarching what are the outcomes that we want because what we want may or may not be feasible, you know, based on Absolutely. You know, what the current obligations are. And a lot of the, the next steps that are listed on here could be dependent on 
just the first two points that we just discussed. So if it's, there's a lot of these things are they, to use another stupid uh, saying as a putting the cart before the horse. I don't know. We don't have time to have the decision to either have the cart or the horse. The cart and the horse have to be moving at the same the same pace. We will, I would like nothing more. Um, Council Member Jizerski went thus the recommendation to council during that focus session, right? Every prior council, those focus sessions were super fun and sticky notes and waterfalls and, uh, and, and, and you all did not get to experience that because staff clearly understood the culmination of what we didn't know. Too many questions mark, too many unknowns of things that we should know. But we can't stop the process of council and what's already in the pipeline while we figure that out. So that internal piece is happening. It's been happening. It influences the memos. It influences the dialogue. It's going to be messy. It, it's not linear. We can't figure all of that out before we start doing anything else. So your path is this path. Our path is that underlying foundation that when we come to August, well, prior to that, I mean, we have um, coming in July is our, and I know that it, it doesn't, because we deal with it every day, it totally makes sense to us. So we need to understand the bonds, right? We need to understand the debt. We need to understand the rate study outcome. We need to understand the pipeline. And at the same time, we need to understand the revenue. What's the, you mentioned that we have to, you know, I guess, work on competing timelines, and I'm kind of wondering why. I'm looking at a lot of these things, and I'm not sure, maybe you can answer this. Sure. What's the, what's the rush on EV, you know, capable parking space requiring, or are, are any of these things, I mean, is, is there a rush? I don't know. I'm just wondering, well, why, why, why can't we figure out the obligations, figure out the outcomes, and then address what we want to do and take next steps. We don't move in the, we, we're not moving like, um, you know, kind of like the little soccer teams, how they, how they all, the ball moves and they all go that direction. There is a whole host of us that are working on different components to this, which is the only way something that is this complex that's, that, that's going to be able to be presented. So, the folks that are working on EV is the different. It is a very different group, and 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 you can look at your. Well, I mean, if, if again, we know where the current priorities are, um, and it's not it's it's not staff's purview um, or obligation, quite frankly, to change those priorities. So council has five staff priorities right now, um, and that does drive where some of our time and attention is. So with those EV charging stations, it's not a lift in and of itself. It's part and parcel of what we've heard for the last two years at each one of these developments. How many EV charging stations? How many EV charging stations, right? So it behooves us to begin to build that in and not have that be a standalone. I think that would make sense. I guess my overall concern was just trying to figure out how do we make Good decisions if we don't know the, the answers to the first two points that we talked about again. I but, couldn't agree more. I'm in that position every day. <laughs> so, well, I think we need to figure that out because I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, I, I felt like it, over the past few years, and not few years, six years, seven, six and a half years, um, there's a lot of times we're making decisions, you know, either in the dark or very, very tunnel decisions. You know, Agreed. Not understanding you know, the, 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 the larger effect that the decision could have. And, and, I think what we've heard is you know, it'd be good to to know the, the big picture stuff first and then that, that, that could you know, make the rest of the discussion a lot easier. So I don't know. We're gonna get there. We're just not we're just not there yet. Yeah. Um, and no no one wants to be there more than more more than 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 this staff. Um, again, Mayor Pro Tem a week doesn't go by that we don't find another nugget of something that we're obligated for that we don't have it's not budgeted. So again, it, it's it's a real um, it's it's a real growth period um, internally and, and externally, and unfortunately, it's going to continue to be messy 
uh, until we can we can we can hone it. Thanks. I just want to put a final shout out. Thanks for including all the information on the, the water water improvements. And that's a, I've been reading a lot about that over the last few weeks now. The, Good. The, the mega drought, 1500 year drought, I guess, that the West is having. So, you know, I know we've been always very, very cognizant of that. And that's really the number one um, issue, I think, for, for us as a city. Because without water, you can't grow and maybe you can't even survive. So, we appreciate that. Yeah, the, the, the new term is liquid gold. Um, and, and one of the things, so Broomfield has been very good about securing the water rights. Um, uh, you all approved Windy Gap. What we didn't have in place is how to get the Windy Gap water to us. It just seems so simple. <laughs> um, but, but it isn't because, it, again, from a, from a structural shift perspective. How are we getting the rest of the water? Uh, a multitude of ways, and and when you when you all are, um, that's. I'm not going to get super complex, um, Mayor, but but, um, the, 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 there's a difference between firming up the water. There's a difference between um, potable water, gray water, um, mm -hmm. and how it. Part of the agreement goes back to a little bit about what, what Council Member Lynn was asking. Um, it, it was the first time that I had seen um, that we had sold wild grass residents on having this really cool reservoir that you're going to be able to boat and swim and uh, fish and have a recreational. Um, and, and the reason I, um, yeah, and I saw that and I was like, well, we need to tell them right now that, that that is never going to happen. Yeah, but. But on the water tour, I mean, we're already getting water from the Trans Mountain Diversion. So how is that getting to Broomfield? Katie, do you want to talk just a little bit about that? Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm all Girl, do you my best. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I'll do my best. Um, so we, we do get um, CBT, CBT water, and it's um, piped into Glasser Reservoir um, for the water treatment plant. We also have Denver water share allocations. Um, but to take advantage of additional water, we need more raw water storage. Um, and with that, I would say I'm not the water supply expert. Um, our, our team is more involved in the distribution, but I, I, I think that's accurate. So Mayor, that's, that's the instrument. So exactly what you just asked, three individual teams work on, one works on getting the water, one works on keeping the water, and one works on distributing water. So right now there's just no distribution from Chimney Hollow to Burnfield. There's there's distribute, there's a there's a there, it's one would think that it's just like one great big pipe and it's just gonna come uh and, and that's just it's not the it, that it's just not the case. It's okay. it's it's much more complicated than that. But the reason that I, I, I say that is structurally from a staff perspective. One spoke to the other after one was already finished. So again, from that comprehensive perspective of how do we do it better? What is it that you're working on? How much does that cost? What are the unintended consequences of front loading and not looking at the back end? No, I, I appreciate this entire discussion and agree this is a, a, an intentional timeline to ensure that we can maintain the service level and maintain the growth and, and everything else. Um, I think the building codes and the zoning updates will provide more certainty to our applicants, but what about the projects that are in the pipeline now? They made significant investments um, and we're now we're in the middle of the game. So what are we telling them to give them some certainty? So Mayor, um, projects that are in the pipeline, uh, they probably have quite a bit of certainty. A lot of those already are approved. Um, so many of them have, if not an approved site development plan, they have an approved planting and development plan that outlines their development standards. They may have development agreements, um, but they have a certain level of certainty um, as they're moving forward. So I think for those projects that are pipeline, the 5,996 units, those developers probably feel very certain as to what they're obligated to do as part of their development. Projects not in the pipeline, um, they're 
if not watching tonight, probably checking in with staff um, to see what the outcomes are after each of the study sessions and the amendments that could be considered. And I'm sure they will be watching closely. Wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Bernie. That's all I have. Does uh, anyone else? Uh, Council Member Marshall. Briefly, Mayor, thank you. Uh, something I just I thought of while Mayor Portem Jadowski was speaking, talking about the chicken and the egg and um, Carla Morris and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, taking a step back, this is a very full schedule. There's a lot of information that we have to go through, and it's all very important. But I guess my concern is that there are other things that are priorities to our residents that aren't in the schedule that. I'm afraid we won't get missed, um, or the, not knowing where we're at. Kind of thing. Um, we talked earlier this year about putting any development on, on the ballot for single hall trash. Mm -hmm. Or we have to have a, a conversation about that. Um, issues the midway open goal plan. Um, obviously, going to come back before us at some point. Um, residential traffic safety, things that, that are important to our residents that aren't necessarily financially re related. Um, I guess my question is, do we need more study sessions? Do we need to have more time to discuss this? I mean, this just seems like a very full schedule. It doesn't seem like we are actually giving adequate time to everything we need to, I guess. So, Mary, if I may clarify. So, this isn't the, your full council schedule. This is only specific to our development items. Right. So, I'm going to give it a night, the July 19th study session. If we have other things that means we're yeah. here. I mean, we, those things right there are you know several hours of conversation. So we time we we we've gotten pretty good um, at timing what those agenda items are. So it's really we plan those uh, various agendas based on the topic, based on what we think how much time it's going to take. Um, so I don't. Foresee, I think it's it's going to be manageable. I mean, um, if if you all look at the last, um, I don't know, ten council meetings, I think you've had two that lasted uh, for more than five hours. So, um, and feeling the pain for those that were on council during COVID when they were here until one or two o'clock, um, a a lot. Um, we try to cap it at a five hour council meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Final thoughts? All right, then. Well, thank you. And thank sure you for the staff that. for this very critical and timely discussion. That concludes the agenda items for this evening's study session. There being no further business, the study session is adjourned.